Hello everyone, before we start today's video, if you could all do me a solid and lightly tap the like button, perhaps share the video about and leave a comment. If you are not subscribed, subscribe as well. It would greatly help this channel. Thank you very much. Captain's Log, Subdex 220718.3 I am so bloody triggered by what Ensign Bork did. I am taking the day off to try and cool off. Only issue here really is, we're all experiencing a bit of a heat wave. That's not going to do any good for my temper right now. I keep on rather stupidly thinking that by making one more video, I won't have to make any more videos on a particular person who we are going to discuss today that you'll see in the thumbnail and the title, so yes, Shumima Begum. And then something else crops up that draws my attention and makes me think, well then, I guess I'm going to have to put more time and effort into this because I like context. I like making sure that everything I have available is presented for you. So yes, we're doing another Shumima video. Currently, there are 14 videos. Technically 15, I did do a topic in last week's exhibition of stupid people, and I'm going to play that clip soon, just so you have the context from that, but in this video, so it can go within the playlist called Shimima Begum's Doodah playlist, because I'm very creative with names, and also because then we have a record of it all. Because something else is yet again cropped up today, and I ha ha, for God's sake. As time has progressed, seven years to be exact, Yes, more and more people are starting to become more enamored to the idea of allowing Shamima to come home. But her situation, well, doesn't allow for that. For a number of reasons. The playlist that I have made so far does explain all of that. But I am going to give you Cliff's notes. Not the whole story, just the reason why she can't come back. And perhaps a few bits afterwards that are relevant that lead up to now. So Shamima Begum, jihadi bride, married, three children, sadly all not with us, lives within a camp in Syria. The jihadi camp as it were, the brides of ISIS. I think that's a group name for something else though. Lived within the caliphate Raqqa, or rubble when it's translated and, you know, demolished, which it was by the time she was captured. Has been trying to get home for a number of years. But the then Home Office Home Secretary Sajid Javid revoked her citizenship because he believed, like many, that she was a threat to this country. And that's because, while she gave a rather interesting interview to Sky, or ITV, or to any other outlet that would hear her plight, many did not buy what she was selling. And over the years, she has tried to change. She has ditched the uh, traditional clothing in favor of more westernized clothing. She's indicated that she likes watching certain TV shows. She's trying to show that she has turned a new page and wants to educate people on these dangers. The problem is the Home Office still does not buy this. Akin to that of a door-to-door -door salesman, it doesn't quite work and the door is firmly shut. The argument was raised in the UK courts that by doing this, by revoking her citizenship, she had become stateless. But on her father's side, who also disavows, she has Bangladeshi roots. So she's not technically stateless, but Bangladesh don't want her either. So she's stuck in that camp. The view that I have held throughout this entire series has been that Shamima should stay there and face the trial, charges, prison, whatever it is she has to do, make amends for her part in what ISIS did in Syria. Enforcing your will upon others physically, brutally, with the threat of unaliveness is not a threat to be taken lightly, especially when you believe your beliefs supersede everyone else's, and if they don't believe you, they are infidels and unworthy of life. This was something Shamima was for a number of years a part of. Whether she actually partook or not is irrelevant. One comment in particular that she had made that really stuck was when she justified the bombings in Manchester at the arena because of what had happened in Syria. An eye for an eye, essentially, which is not something anyone can justify. But she did. She did eventually feel regret for saying it. But no one still, no one is buying what she is trying to sell, which is why she's in the position that she is. So the UK courts have given her nothing. They have not allowed her back, and they're not likely to. There are still legal challenges mounted, of course, 
There's also a belief that she's already in the United Kingdom. I'm not entirely sure if that's true or not, and I'm not inclined to push a conspiracy without hard evidence to support it. In last week's exhibition of Stupid People, I spoke about how Shamima is going to be getting a two-part special on the BBC and, yes, obligatory, defund the BBC. And for this bit, I'm now going to play that clip, as it is important. Before we go to what filmmakers have been asking for with regards to Shamima that has led to this video even happening. The BBC, and I'll insert it now, defund the BBC, has decided to make a two-part documentary on BBC Two and a ten-part audio series for Radio 5 where it will explore the story of Shamima Begum. The filmmaker Josh Baker, who is going to be making this, has said that this is one of the most talked about, yet least understood stories of our time. I keenly await to see how they frame this then as grooming, which is what many arguments seem to centre around. When journalists went to the area where she comes from, in London, they were very much split. Two thirds said, no, she can stay there. The other third said, well, she was just a girl, just give her a chance. For over 12 months, Shamima has been talking to investigative journalist Josh Baker, giving him what she says is her definitive account of everything that happened to her. Back in 2015, Josh Baker was working on a documentary in East London Mosque when news broke that three local schoolgirls had disappeared and were on their way to join ISIS. Baker at the time was filming the mosque trying to bring the families to get their daughters home. Ultimately, only one would actually survive. The other two, one of known is definitely deceased, the other I'm not entirely sure about. The one that survived seven years ago is Shamima. The alleged attempt of this is to dispel the fiction and unearth new information along the way, and also trying to explain the points of the travel from Bethnal Green to the Caliphate in Syria. I personally think this is a colossal waste of taxpayer money, because this is no doubt going to be used solely as a way of trying to create sympathies here. We know this, and my tolerance, patience, whatever you want to call it, for what she did does not change. And I do not believe Shamima should be allowed back into this country. There is a chance, sure, a very slim one, that she could actually serve as an educator to prevent more people from doing things like what she did. But it is far too much of a risk, I believe. I also don't believe her going to prison in this country would work anyway, especially considering the representation split in our prisons, but also the no doubt argument of violated human rights that will cause us to not put her in prison, just let her walk free. Add to that, I believe she's still married to somebody who has not renounced his ways either. Isn't he also serving in a prison for what he did for ISIS? On the 14th of July 2022, an article was published by the Daily Mail. A British filmmaker who has formed close bonds with jihadi brides including Shamima has called for Britain to bring home the families of ISIS fighters who are being held in Syrian camps because they are our problem. Andrew Drury, who regularly visits the Al Roj camp in northeast Syria, says he feels sorry for 22-year-old Shamima. Drury has also said he has formed such a close relationship with other foreign jihadi brides at the camp, including American Hoda Muthana, German national Hafida Hadush, that they hug him, pose for selfies with him, and ask for gifts for their children. Drury believes that the UK has a responsibility to bring British jihadi brides like Shamima home and their children because it was not fair to leave them to be in danger to the Syrians and the Kurds who have enough danger to deal with already. Now, when it comes to the children of the brides, I firmly believe they need to be taken away. When Shamima had her children, and she had one that I knew of that was alive, before that one sadly also passed, I said that child needed to come to the United Kingdom immediately, because that child was in danger. That child, to me, was an innocent, and therefore that child does not belong there. Is Shamima innocent? No. Drury also said they are our problem and we should be dealing with our own mess. The problem is, we don't know how to deal with this mess. But also, additionally, unless I am very much mistaken, I do not believe she is our problem anymore. Her citizenship was, after all, revoked. And unless her citizenship is somehow reinstated, she's repatriated, it's not happening. Shamima is currently among a 50-strong British contingent of women and children at the encampment, which houses around 800 families in total. Drury has also formed close bonds with two other British ISIS brides, which includes one who is a mother in Yorkshire. He firmly believes that his working-class background has meant he can relate to the ISIS brides. 
who married, you know, jihadists who plotted terror attacks against the West. Yeah, that that's um that's what we working class people do all the time. We're in fact always plotting it. But only on the 5th of November. Full quote from Drury reads as follows. Posing for a selfie with a nicest bride for me is to make them feel more comfortable. It makes them for a moment feel included and perhaps forget where they are. For me, it's purely because I'm telling their story and not an expression of friendship as such. I form these relationships to enable me to tell the stories of the women in the camp and posing for photos with them helps break down barriers. Adding that he feels guilty about these close bonds he has formed saying, I feel guilty every time they hug me. I feel guilty each time I get back from the camp because I never know for sure what these women did under ISIS. Only they know the truth of that. So you want us to bring them home, but even you admit you can't be sure of anything. That's fascinating, Andrew. Truly fascinating. But it's our problem, everyone. If in the context of feeling sorry for anyone, you want to feel sorry for anyone, feel sorry for the children who are stuck there. The adults? No. And I know Shamima was 15 and there's a chance here because it has been reported that she was in fact groomed. Unfortunately, uh, that grey area does not help her in the slightest. The decision was already made. There isn't exactly a huge amount of support to bring her back. There is no politician in parliament who's like, openly, by the way, saying, yeah, let's bring her home. Yeah, that's a good idea. The optics on that are fantastic, everyone. You may feel guilty because you are there in that situation, but we are here. We do not feel guilty. I can promise you that. 